But in yeah, the but sort he's of... throwing at his goofy loopy punches are always on different goofy yeah. loops. It's all weird I don't know hooks and uppercuts deliberate. and straights. I think it is. I mean, I think he has an idea of uh, sure? overwhelming somebody and sneaking around their defenses and catching them when they're reacting badly. He, he's... Maybe he just can't control... Maybe his arms are just like an octopus's arms. Yeah. And, like, each one of them has their own separate nervous system. That's... <laughs> And, like, he can tell them to get to a punch, to get to a target, but how each one of them tries to get there is up to its, like, is up to each individual arm. I think this is as good an explanation for Sergei Pavlovich's punching as anything else you'll find. Um, (laughs) He's got a sort of a generative AI in each fist. mm -hmm. He has to type a prompt, right hand. Attack target, and then it sort of has to learn how to get there as it goes. Hello, hello, and welcome to Heavy Hands. I'm Gonna Rebush. That's Phil. You getting this confused with one of your many other podcasts? I only have one other podcast. Well, I guess one and a half. Does the MMA depressed us count? Also, none of them notably are ones which you announce. Yeah, this is really the only one I do the intro for. I was getting <laughs> confused by something else. Other things. Hello, Perfect. hello. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm Connor, that's Phil. Hello. Hey. And today, we're talking about big boys. It's the big boys yeah. special. Our area of expertise, I think you will all agree. Let me tell you, when I looked at the lineup for this card we're coming up on here, that being uh, UFC 295, and I consider that also we're going to have to talk a little bit about last week's main event, that was uh, Almeida versus Lewis, and I realized that three of the major fights... That is, the bulk of the segments on today's episode will be comprised of discussion about men who weigh far more than any man should weigh. (laughs) A sense of uh, dread (laughs) sort of (laughs) crept into me. (laughs) I was like, oh my god. All we do on this show is joke about how heavyweight sucks and rules don't apply and the matchups don't make any sense and how like having one skill, one skill at all will make a huge difference in these fights. And we have to talk about essentially three of them. Three big boy fights. Let me tell you their names, and then you can get Phil's thoughts on that proposition. Of course, the main event of UFC 295, Yuri Prochaska, is back. Uh, this is a title fight, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure. Fighting for the once again vacant UFC. It's as if he never left, or it's as if he left and then nothing happened in the interim. Because, of course, he won the title against Glover Teixeira and then vacated it. And then several things happened, I guess. I can't quite remember all of them. Anyway, the title's empty again. And he's back. He's taking on Alex Pereira, former middleweight champion um, for the vacant belt. In the co-main event of this card, Sergei Pavlovich versus Tom Aspinall. And you could just tell by the sounds of their names. These are two beefy boys. And then uh, the aforementioned... uh, Jailton Almeida versus Derek Lewis main event from last week, and we're going to have to talk about that too. So, Phil, how are you feeling? What's the sort of instinctive uh, impulse that you uh, you get when you when I tell you you're going to be talking about nothing but beef boys for the next hour? For these beef boys, I feel perplexed because I look at this lineup and I'm like, from a skills perspective, these fights are not difficult to call. Mm. And yet, and yet, and yet, is um, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I guess there is something freeing about the big boy fights because, uh, there's in some ways like there's less on the line from like an analytics perspective because you know if something incredibly weird happens, you can just be like, oh well, and you can largely <laughs> dismiss it because they're all terrible anyway. <laughs> like, and it's just the nature of these fights yeah. that they are always like weird and inexplicable, and 
Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that fight where Yuri Prochaska won the belt off Glover Teixeira, very who predictable. Out there was was picking that he was going to win by submission. <laughs> By submission with, like, three seconds left in the fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nothing in that fight was remotely predictable other than the complete and utter chaos that it was. That's yeah. all you could count on. And everything else was just mayhem, like, absolute mayhem. And, um, yeah, I mean, that is the defining trait uh, of the light heavyweight division. It's like... Big guys who are too athletic and, uh, they're not, they're almost like they're not, they're big guys who aren't gentle enough to be heavyweights, you know? Mm -hmm. A heavyweight would like to dispatch you with one clean strike. I mean, ideally, a heavyweight would prefer to scavenge, you know? Out in nature, the heavyweight is really better suited to sort of coming across some forgotten carcass, and that's how he gets his calories. It's only in the occasionally economy. just scooping a, a salmon out of a stream with one <laughs> giant paw. Yeah. Some heavyweights are filter feeders, actually. I believe that's the uh, I believe that's the case with um, oh, who's a funny who's a funny fighter to be a filter feeder. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Forget that joke. Forget. I thought that you joke. had something ready to go here. <laughs> I set it up. I was like, oh god, who's a good filter feeder? Uh. D- Alexi Olinik? Name out of a hat. Does it work? You're just saying that because I mentioned him like I 10 know. minutes ago. That's how my brain works. Anyway, it's Big Beef Boys. That's the uh, that's the topic of the day. And um, we're certainly starting with the most dynamic, the most violent, the most insane of the Beef Boys. Those being the ones who, uh, as I said, are not really good-natured enough um, or slow enough to be heavyweights. Yuri Prashazka... Alex Pereira, and as you said before, Phil, uh, this is one of these fights. All three of these really have this quality where there is sort of a very logical uh, pick that that sort of comes to mind right when you look at it. And then if you look at it mm-hmm. any more closely, it's like all the seams start showing, and that pick suddenly does not seem safe or uh, or, or even really intelligent. Like... My gut feeling looking at this was there's no way Yuri Poshazka can get into a striking battle with Alex Pereira striking the way he does and not get chinned. My yep. mind rebels at the idea that Poshazka can go out there doing uh, weird kung fu punches with his chin just hanging up in the air, no thought of defense in his head at all, and not get nuked by Alex Pereira. And yet? And yet. And like, yet Bruno Silva, I believe, was what you said before. Yeah. yeah, I was like, how much better is Yuri Prochaska than Bruno Silva? And obviously, like, one of the answers to this question is, from a skills perspective, he's not. But, you know, <laughs> not as much as you'd think. <laughs> no, he is huge and hyper-athletic and, uh, and fearless and young. Or at least comparatively young. I think he's, like, 30 now. Yeah. Um... So, and yeah, like, one of the, at least one of these things I think is obviously instructive, because, yeah, Yuri is a massive light heavyweight, yeah. which means that, like, he'll probably only be giving up uh, about six inches and about 40 pounds yeah. to uh, Alex Pereira. <laughs> he'll probably give up no more than, is... a, than a foot and a half in reach. Yeah, I mean, um, that's crazy. Uh, and yeah, I, I do find myself, like, looking at Pereira's fights just being like, how often have you ever fought anyone who is simply as big as you and who wants to fight long? And I'm not saying that Prochaska is good at fighting long, but he does fight long. He fights very long in a weird way. He will lunge in from range with, like, big, giant punches. And 
uh, then either skitter back out again or just get stuck in there and, and brawl with people. As you said, there's no defense here. But also, and there's no, I think and there's one no of the management. things which I found... There's no management of yeah. range. That is my pushback on the... I would almost say he doesn't fight long. I would say he is long. That's kind of how he I view your He makes sure that he fights from like a giant bladed stance. He takes huge yes. um, steps. Like... He, you know, as as we we said, I was we were saying before the uh, we we started the show, like he jabs like he is a fencer trying to impale his opponent, like yeah, the absolute like most comical kind of of long striking. Yeah, he will literally like extend his 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 fist out as he like bends his lead yeah. leg and lunges from the like lid, the arm the that isn't arm. punching flies out behind him for counterweight. To, to, as, mm-hmm. he's, as he's trying to literally run you through with his fists. But they are such committed lunges that, as you said, he's either skittering wildly out of range or he's just stuck in and he is just keeping, trying to keep the attack going. There is, this is my only pushback. He gets effective from long range basically for one strike at a time. And then he's yep. not at long range anymore. He has no notion like Jan Blokovic fights long. Yes. Yuri Prochaska is long. That's my distinction. <laughs> oh, I, I still think he does he does fight long. It's just like he's not again, yeah, he's not I get what very you're good at it. It's yeah. like yeah, yeah. He's he's definitely trying to extend the movement yes. and like the limits of his frame like as much as possible I mean, to a comical extent. Yes. Frankly. Yeah, I, I um, totally agree. Yeah, I mean, like, so one of the things was watching the uh, Blahovich fight, which we, we both agreed, like, Jan just owns him in the third round uh, yeah. with his striking, not the takedown. Um, but yeah, no, that is. And, yeah. And uh, one of the things we were worried about, like, concerned about that fight for Jan was, like, how is the Blacko Blitz going to fare against Pereira's counters? And and the answer was mostly just kind of fine. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Pereira hates having people <laughs> charging at him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, you know, this shows up in the Bruno Silva fight um, as much as it does in the Jan Blavich fight for all the fact that, you know, these are two very differently skilled opponents. But just like someone just leaping through space being huge, um, or at least not even huge in the case of Bruno Silva, like... Uh, but Eric just wants to back out of the way and then uh, be there to land his, and then you know, be able to dictate range from where he's a giant huge person again. Mm-hmm. He just backs straight out of the pocket, pretty much. Um, and yeah, this allowed like many Blacko blitzes, blitzes to land. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he didn't really get punished for him all that much. So yeah, it's one of those ones where I just find myself thinking like. As you said, like it's impossible not to think of Pereira just absolutely nailing him at some point. Yeah, just he he is present in the fight at all points, like from a a, a defensive standpoint, in ways that Yeri simply is not. There are points when Yeri is in the pocket trading with people, and the idea of him being punched is utterly alien to him. Yeah. He's just not thinking about it. He's just not thinking of it at all. And, yeah, it is, it is impossible to see Pereira not absolutely decking him in that situation. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I'm like, what if just being giant and young and being able to make Pereira uncomfortable by just, like punching him from really far away just drags it into an ugly fight what are we i mean like what if we get into the third round and Pereira hasn't and we haven't mentioned this yet kicked yuri's lead leg off Mm -hmm. and or like you know knocked him out does he can he go five rounds with uh someone who's been like at this weight class because he looked very gassed against Jan Blahovic, who is a famously like gassable fighter. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, yeah, that, that 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 last thing, that aside, I think is my last like thing, which means that in the end, I don't think I can pick against Pereira because I think it's it's the low kicks, um, mm-hmm. uh, the giant bladed stance. Um, I think is is she's just uh, just gonna get Gary chewed up. Pereira, we know uh, from multiple sources, those being the opponents he's fought, he is an uncannily hard kicker. Mm-hmm. Even when, I mean, he is these super long pendulums. Uh, he does not have to actually throw a kick hard to do considerable damage with it. And for sure, he is going to get a lot of chances to just strafe Brachowska with calf kicks. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think connected to that, uh, as it often is, the the very interesting question of this fight is, who gets to come forward? Because you have pointed mm-hmm. out that uh, Pereira is uh, doesn't like being swarmed. Neither does yeah, who's the guy who beat him in kickboxing before he came to MMA. That was a great performance. Um, uh, Archer like or something. Series. What's that? Archer or something? Maybe was the guy's name. Yes, it does ring a bell. It was, oh, sorry, Artem Vakitov. Yes. Yeah. Where bo- both of their fights yeah, were very, very close. Um, and, and Vakitov yeah, yeah. was not nearly as um, powerful as a guy like Prashaska. He was like a, fulfilled the role of a swarmer in that fight. Yes. And, and let's not uh, let's not forget, had to absorb a lot of punishment himself, and was also way more defensively sound <laughs> than Yuri Prochaska oh, yeah, like, is going to be. Uh, it would it would be uh, blasphemous to compare him to Yuri Prochaska or Bruno Silva. Like that's an incredible like pressure performance from yeah someone who was also like I, mean, I guess everyone uh, hugely outsized by Pereira. Yeah, he was the size of a human being. Um, yeah, but this is the thing: is that Prochaska is absolute dog shit when he is being pressured. Mm-hmm. His game does not make sense if he is not holding the initiative, because that that's his whole thing. He's like, um, he's confusing you. He's striking from all these bizarre angles. He has never dreamed of putting his hands near his chin. Uh, he's in this weird bladed fencer stance. Um. And, you know, he is ready when he's, like, pressuring. He's ready to slip or pull or d- or duck under a shot. Once he starts throwing, of course, those thoughts go out the window. And they aren't particularly good or thoughtful defenses when he is thinking defensively. Uh, because, as I just uh, picked up from his fight with Glover Teixeira, uh, an all-timer and a completely insane matchup where he's, like, losing half the time, uh, the moment in round five when Glover Teixeira was like, what if I do two jabs and then a right hand? He just started <laughs> clobbering Prochaska. He started crushing him with every strike he threw, just like what we talked about with Adesanya against Pereira um, and Adesanya against Strickland. This complete disregard for efficiency in defense uh, for de- for any kind of defense which actually like leaves you in a good stable position, um, means that he's super susceptible uh, to being opened up by any kind of like initiative grabbing strike, any kind of wedge to use uh, a term of yours that I qu- I quite like. Yeah, it, it- anything and any any strike that is designed to push someone out of position yeah and set you can be something sure else that it up. will push the it will push Yuri Prochaska if it if it does what it's supposed to it will push him very far out of position yeah it works uh it works like an absolute charm because that is how his defense works and when he's on the back foot he is thinking more defensively and is just super susceptible to being built on, to being, uh, to, to having layers just piled up on his face, which is, of course, completely unguarded. And his chin is way high in the air. I mean, you want to say how much better is, um, Prochaska than Bruno Silva? How much better is Alex Pereira than Vulcan Uzdemir? 
who spent the first round of his fight with uh, Prochaska just basically running him backwards and Prochaska like turning his back and flinging himself away and just getting cracked <laughs> over and over with clean shots and getting and getting chewed up with low kicks. Yep. And and having no constructive way of actually getting the only way he gets the initiative is by overwhelming you with his like he stands in front of you like, oh, this guy wants to hit me. If you don't care about that, then he is going to put himself in terrible, terrible positions. And any clean strike or any little wedge, any jab, any feint, you're going to get so many openings on the feet against a guy like Yuri Pachowska. So that to me is the big question here is, does Pereira realize he needs to pressure? And if he does, couldn't he just like KO Pachowska in the first round? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a fight where it seems like he should. Yeah, but he doesn't really pressure that much these days. That is the other thing about Pereira. Like, as an MMA fighter, we've been really impressed because he's gotten quite good at not being a pressure fighter. Uh, he has showed mm -hmm. improved footwork and improved distance management, and his kicking game has really come a long way, weirdly. Like an anti Joanna Jacek, his kicking game has actually, I think, flourished in MMA. Um, yep. But I don't think that's the right way to fight Yuri Prochaska, given that he just completely explodes when he is put on the back foot. And it is guaranteed, like, the only kind of fight that isn't him losing is for him to brawl, like, once he's put on the back foot. And, you know, yeah, Panetta could still lose a brawl, but so could Prochaska, and he's going to look like shit doing it. Yeah. As I said, like, I think it's it's very difficult to actually pick Prochaska because he's very much of the Dominic Cruz or uh, Tony Ferguson school of, like, self-taught guy, kind of self-taught looking guys doing what they yeah. think is cool. Yeah. Kind of stuff. But, like, they have genuine skill bases that he sort of doesn't. Yeah. What he has is he's huge and he's very athletic. He has a great chin, though he has been knocked out. And he he fully believes that he can like survive any kind of crazy fight. I mean, it is a scary proposition to fight Yuri Prochaska because all these things are true. But if you do not end him, he he's, you know, like I said, that first round of that fight with Volkan Ustamir, he's getting pressured, he's getting run backwards, and he looks terrible, like truly bad. Yep. And then round two, he gets a small reprieve. Vulcan takes his foot off the gas, and Prashadka just completely overwhelms him and knocks him out cold. This happens yeah. in I mean, a it's, lot. It's the end of round one, right? He starts going, Prashadka just starts going absolutely insane. Yeah. yeah. And Uzdemir, like, is clearly, like... He's, it scares him. Taken aback. Yeah, he's, he's taken aback. Yeah, and I'm not mocking him. And, I'm saying uh, it should yeah, that's, scare that's him. All it's all that it needs to be. I'm not, I'm not teasing yeah. Ustamir. Like it's it's scary. Oh, you you hit this guy with all your best shots. He's looked like trash the entirety of this round, and here he is acting like it was like part of his plan, and he's enjoying himself, and he's coming at you, and like it doesn't put him off at all. So you have to knock him out. Yep. But yeah. I'm yeah, I guess I, I do have to pick Pereira, but it's just the weird... I keep getting this weird image that we're going to be like going into round five and that it's going to be like the Pereira, yeah, the, the, the Teixeira fight. fight again. Yeah. And it's going to have been, it's just going to be some... I've been some mad, messy brawl. They're yeah. both going to be gas to hell. And I'm not going to know what's going to happen. But yeah, I have, to, I have to pick Pereira. He's got an incredible chin. Uh, he's only going to be cutting like 100 pounds to make light heavyweight uh so his chin's presumably going to be better mm -hmm. um and yeah he's got like he's you know if he was a fragile fighter i might pick Francesca to knock him out but he isn't he's clearly got an amazing chin and i mean you know, he, he, both hit him of many these, times and it yeah both of these dudes are not uh they don't have i wouldn't say the best chins um, but both of them have very good chins. Like they've both been KO'd, they've both been hurt. But both I mean again, like with 
you know, with Pereira, you, you might be able to say that he might actually be more durable at light heavyweight because he was clearly cutting a yeah. tremendous amount of weight. But I mean, with Yuri, it's just like, how does this guy got not get KO'd all the time? Yeah, every single fight. Because he... when he's getting, when he's getting, you know, when he's getting hit, it is clean. He is not seeing it coming. He is like facing off the other direction. He's not in position to um, absorb it. Like his stance is not there. Yeah, that's a yeah, good yeah. point. Actually, I'm going to revise that and say that Yuri Prochaska clearly has a superhuman chin. Because a yeah, man getting hit in the positions he gets hit in should be getting knocked out constantly. And he doesn't. Yep. Um, uh, so yeah, you just you just have to pick. Uh, you have to pick Pereira. Like he's got he's got the skill set advantage in the area where we know the fight's gonna take place. If Yeri comes out and like shoots takedown, I will be shocked. Yeah. And even then, like again, like Pereira's actually an okay defensive wrestler and grappler now. He's okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna um, pick so Pereira yeah, too. Gotta, but... gotta pick I mean I'm probably gonna pick him by uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go round one KO. <laughs> he, might, because, he might, right? Yeah, because Yuri has such consistently terrible round ones against everyone but Glover. Yeah, and he is, you know, as a, as a, a sort of innovative fighter, he is one of those ones who also is clearly, you know, he builds it from what happens in the fight. Yeah. What defense and timing he has, you know, he he kind of learns it on the fly, which means that he often has to learn it in the process of getting his shit pushed in. Yeah, Carlos Condit style. Um, yep. So yeah, I'm gonna take Pereira by round one KO. Yeah, I have the same feeling. I mean, I'm very very wary. I, w- one thing I'll say is that the the Tashira fight was as insane as it was because it was really too two very good fighters trying to have two completely different fights. Mm. Um, and I have to wonder if Tashira had taken a different approach, if he might have beaten Prochaska on the feet. Because it, yeah. I think it was his fundamental understanding that he, the way, the place he beat Prochaska was on the ground, something they both agreed about, right? Like Prochaska before the fight was talking about, I can't let Tashira on my back, yada, yada, all this defensive grappling talk. And that was clearly the approach Tashira took. And it, and with good reason, his best success in the fight for the most part was on the ground. He, he was much better there. Um, but it was a really exhausting kind of fight to maintain. And it put him, I think, in a mindset where he allowed Prochaska to pressure him. And that is a terrible place to be because he is a super overwhelming, swarming, awkward swarming fighter. Um, with big power and just really confusing to give him the initiative and then try to guess what he's going to do. But like I said, in round five, when Teixeira is like, all right, it's it's do or die. I'm going to have to put my foot on the gas. And he was still thinking of takedowns. He hurt Prochaska so many times in round five and always followed up with a shot. And if he hadn't done that, I yes. think he might have knocked Prochaska out because he was landing yep. on him all day. And this is the thing. I think Prochaska is very much one of these fighters who is a good striker against MMA fighters. Because he's very confusing yep. and weird and creative and he's big and he's athletic and, and he makes it up as he goes along and he's fearless. And these are all great qualities in any combat sport. But, like, if somebody were to go in there against your Prochaska and be like, I know I'm a very good striker. I'm going to outstrike you. I think they could. I really think they could. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we can agree with like both of these guys is that what really happened is that the grapplers that they were up against could have just outstruck them in their last fights, but instead gassed themselves out yeah. going for grappling all the time. Yeah, it's 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 totally true of both of them, in fact. Jan Blokovic should have um, had higher regard for his own striking abilities. And Glover Teixeira could have, I think, done the same and punished Prochaska even worse than he did on the feet. I think he could have put a more sustained beating on him uh, if he had sort of believed that that was a viable way to beat Prochaska. Um, yep. So yeah, it could be chaotic, but 
some of that particular kind of chaos is taken out of the equation when you consider that Pereira is not going to be trying to have, in broad terms, he's not going to be trying to avoid the kind of fight Prochaska wants. He is going to engage him on the feet. Yeah. That's obviously where he has to engage everybody. He's not going to be looking for outs. When he senses openings, the way that he is going to try to build and punish Prochaska is going to be in the area where I believe Prochaska is actually weakest, his striking defense. Um, so I'm going to pick him. But if he doesn't pressure at all, if he, um, then I think he could really end up in trouble. Uh, yeah. You know, just throwing up the guard and letting Prochaska unload. And Prochaska will throw body shots. He will throw uppercuts and hooks and elbows and all kinds of weird shit from crazy angles. It's not impossible for me to imagine uh, uh, Pereira himself getting overwhelmed on the feet uh, or just yeah, getting I mean, clipped. You know, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, compared to Carlos Condit. Like, Carlos Condit is a creative fighter. Like, you don't want to give creative fighters the room to be creative. Right. Because, you know, that that's the whole point. They won't be predictable. Yeah. So, a um, a considered pick for Pereira. Um, I will say, very much looking forward to this fight. Mm -hmm. Like, how could you not? It will be a banger, whatever happens. Pretty much. It's very hard, he says, confidently cursing it. <laughs> it's going to be an absolute stinker. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I cannot imagine. That. I can't like, imagine. Here he just cannot have... He just cannot have boring fights. Yeah. I mean, we haven't even talked about the fact that this is his first fight back in what? Was it been like two years? Something like that, yeah. Uh, actually, not that. Not as long as I thought. He fought, uh, it was about a year and a half ago, he fought Teixeira. Boy, a lot has happened since. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was a knee injury. Uh... I mean, who knows what effect that might have had on him. I believe it was, right? A knee injury? Yeah, like a really bad one, right? It's, oh no, excuse uh, me. Um, was, it, was it? It, was, it was his right shoulder. It's his shoulder. It was his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Equally troubling. I mean, that's another bad chronic type of injury to have. So we'll yep. see if that's affected him. I suspect he won't yep. allow it to uh, to affect the way he fights if he can avoid it. Like he's, I just think he's fundamentally insane. And yeah, whoever wins this one presumably fights Jamal Hill if he's able to come back. Oh, can't wait for that one. Uh, whatever, you know. It'll, I mean, again, it would It'll be, a it'll be two strikers going at it. It'll be fine. Yeah, light heavyweight uh, of the two big, the big beef boy divisions is certainly the one where you can expect the most completely insane violence. Um. Anyway, yep. meanwhile, somewhere. Somewhere, um, what's his face? Um, guy who fought Johnny Walker last time. Uh, Uncle Iev. You've, Iyev you've forgotten his name. There looking at these people. Yeah, yeah. He's just going to be sitting there looking at all these title fights going past of these people who just cannot wrestle at all. Yeah. It's going to be thinking, oh, damn it, I've got to fight Johnny Walker again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's uh let's call it there for this first segment. When we return, Sergey Pavlovich versus Tom Aspinall. Maybe we'll touch on a couple of other undercard fights. It's not the deepest card for a pay-per-view, I got to be honest. Nope. Um but uh, probably at the end we are going to dip back into last week's main event at the very least and talk about uh, Jailton Almeida versus Derek Lewis. Both of those, possibly more after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to the show. Heavyweights, Phil. 
What was that? You had some smart yep. remark? No, no, more confusion. <laughs> I mean, now we've, we're going to the even dumber division. <laughs> yeah, we have here on tap Sergei Pavlovich, Tom Aspinall. Um, and once again, I do feel there is a, there is an instinctive pick that you just kind of got to make here. And, uh, we may once again talk ourselves just right back into the instinctive position. Maybe that's the best way to go anyway. You know, you get a gut check, you get a, a gut read on something and you're like, uh, you know, it's so easy to talk yourself into a worse pick. I mean, not that we would know, but it's so easy to sort of logic trap yourself away from the sensible pick. Maybe just uh, doing a, a gut call is how people who are good at picking fights do it. Yep. I've got enough gut. Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, it would be nice to, you know, we just don't know what that's like. You know, people who are good at picking fights might as well just be space aliens. <laughs> <laughs> How do they do it? Magic, I'm going to assume. It's <laughs> some kind um, of magic. But yeah, like, this fight. Um, yeah, Tom Espinal, he's got, like, a skill set. Right. In some ways, he's got, like, more than one skill set. He's re- almost it's crazy. He's all, he's practically a light he heavyweight. Think... Yeah, who does he think he is? Alistair Overeem? <laughs> Stipe Miocic? Yeah. One of our... Cain Velazquez? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and meanwhile, like, Sergei Pavlovich is... Punches. Punch man. Punch man. Punch man, shaped like fridge. Big, pale. Yep. Uh, 30, yeah. 30% orangutan DNA. Or, alternatively, as we will touch on later, octopus. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so Tom Aspinall probably should win this because he can do the wrestle. He's a decent striker. Mm-hmm. And he's also just incredibly quick on his feet. And Sergei Pavlovich is not quick on his feet. No. But on the other hand, like the one fight that I was thinking about before this. Uh, before we recorded this, and then watched and was immediately, uh, like, had my suspicions confirmed. Like, that Curtis Blades fight with uh, Tom Aspinall is extremely concerning. It's it's only, we should point this out right away, it's only 15 seconds long. Mm -hmm. So it is a very, very, very small sample size to draw any conclusions from. I'm wary of any conclusions we might draw from this, but you did have a point to make uh, regarding those 15 seconds. It's basically 15 seconds of Tom Aspinall coming up with his chin up in the air, punching as much as he can, and not caring much about what happen what comes back yeah if there is a worst case scenario for him fighting against sergey pavlovich it is this approach yeah it is him ignoring the counter punches coming back at him and being obsessed with trying to hit his opponent because i mean apart from anything else he almost certainly will be able to hit sergey pavlovich if he just goes after him guaranteed uh you know punching is does not cover like getting out of the way of punches or uh even like being fast enough to move out of the way out of punches. No, punch is uh, punch. Your... It's, just, it's, just, it's just punching, and it's just having <laughs> uh, long arms. That is it. Uh, but yeah, this is exactly the way in which uh, like Aspinall could lose that fight. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Aspinall is he gets beamed right on the chin, like in the, on the counter, in almost every fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's got a real, like, Leon Edwards kind of uh, you know, I'm standing straight up. My uh, posture is good. What could possibly happen here? Yeah. Like, they could hit you. Sometimes you have to move your head to get out of the way. Yeah. I mean, even in his fight with, like, Marcin Tibora, 
another very short one. I mean, this is, I can't even caution too much against taking lessons from the Curtis Blades fight because the only fight that goes on at all is Aspinall's fight with Arlovsky. Um, yep. I suppose the Volkov one where he just completely leaned on a wrestling advantage. And that is something we're going to have to talk about here is the fact that he is genuinely well rounded by the standards of this division. Um, but even in that, you know, almost equally brief fight with, uh, Tabora. Yeah. He's just like, he's, he's bounding in, you know, he's, he's real light in his feet. And then the moment he gets a position, the moment he sees an angle to get a strike in, it's like, I'm going to throw two hard punches and then he's going to throw back and I'm going to bound backwards. And then I'm going to jump right back in. And in one of those instances, he just gets cracked, uh, with a right hand, just straight on the chin because he leans back as he sort of takes an angle and then just hops back in and full on combination punching mode and all thought of defense is out the window. And, um, yeah, this is a thing that recurs in, like I said, almost every one of his fights that he will just stand right in front of somebody or will try to extend an exchange beyond the point at which it is safe. Um, He's not like as insane. He's much better put together as a boxer compared to like Yuri Puchaska. But I think his yes, brain exactly. kind of works the same way. Mm-hmm. Where he's, as you know, as well it might if you're a yeah right young, fairly like fairly untested fighter. You're, you know, he he comes across as a thoughtful guy a yes, student yes. of the game but also he's never had any real, real real reason to internalize fear or caution yeah and um he doesn't know what he doesn't know and may go on not knowing it for some time yet because he is a really special heavyweight athlete no question but um yeah i think his brain works like yuri's like he wants initiative he wants pressure um he wants to overwhelm his opponents and so his thought uh, is that if there's any defense required, if it's just like a quick angle change, if it's leaning back, if it's a slip, that is to be followed up immediately with even more committed offense than what you led with. Um, mm-hmm. And this is just a, a place where he gets tagged. And 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 truly, the Curtis Blades fight, um, you can't, I think we said this at the time, you can't remove Blades' punches from the result. It's not purely an accident. It is that Aspinall comes in firing a kick with no setup, and Curtis Blades just pulls the trigger. 2-1, straight punches right down the middle. They don't land super clean, but they catch Aspinall totally out of position, and I I believe it's pretty clear that that is what causes the awkward recovery step he tries to take uh, in order not to fall down from his kick that blows out his knee. Uh-huh. It is because he's so counterable that he injured his knee in that fight. It's it's at least part of what happened there. Yeah. And um, I think one of the sort of concerning things for this, because again, I think he's probably someone who knows and understands the danger that uh, Sergei Pavlovich presents. He's not a stupid man. Right. Um, and, he's, you know, he's, as I said, he seems like a, a thoughtful person. But one of the issues is that if he tries going for, like, you know, quick committed offense, all this kind of stuff, it's going to work. It's going to work really well. Yeah. <laughs> he is going to land cleanly on Sergei Pavlovich, as many people have, because mm-hmm. that's not very hard to do. He's going to get a lot Curtis of Blades positive... Was, feedback right yes Curtis Blade himself was for the yes was for the most part uh like smashing uh Sergei Pavlovich on the feet yeah and he was just like man I'm just gonna keep doing this then until he wasn't yeah that's a very good point uh, because yeah, so I think even if he comes in with like a smart game plan, I think it, it, there's a there is a good chance that he gets overwhelmed by the sheer joy of punching Sergei Pavlovich in the face <laughs> because it's easy. But yeah, so we were talking about this before. Um, one of the things that makes Sergei Pavlovich, you know, more threatening than some of the other big hitters in uh, you know UFC heavyweight history, I guess is that he does, in fact, throw in combination. Mm-hmm. 
He does throw multiple punches. Again, he doesn't really care what's coming back at him very much because he's sure that he's going to be able to land with more. But this is something which does not generally play well with people who get, you know, stuck in zones with no defense because he can just bury people under a wave of punches. Again, it's eventually what happened to Curtis Blades. Yep. Um, he just got hit by something coming from a weird angle and it got dusted. He is, I think, as we, again, we might have said in the previous episode, he is basically Alexei Alinek. Yeah. Uh, but only the striking and young. <laughs> and, and supercharged. I mean, he's, he's more, I think, athletic than Alinek ever was. Sergei, Sergei in, in some ways, it would be difficult to tell if you just got just Alinek just punching and then, you know, because he was, how old was he? 84? Something. 85, something like, something yeah. like that. Yeah. When he, well, that was when he first came to the UFC. Yeah. He was there for years. A fresh, young, 96-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> back when he, he only had 35 Ezekiel chokes on his record back then. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Uh, but you know, P- Pavlovich is, I think he's a good athlete. I mean, he's, he's, it's pretty clear to me. And he's not quick on his feet, as you said. He doesn't have like the agility of a Cyril Gunn or a Tom Aspinall, but he is quick handed. Um, he has excellent balance, even though he puts himself in really awkward stances. Um, and, and yeah, like you said, like his, his combinations are not good. But they are effective for a reason, and it's not just the fact that he hits like a truck, which he obviously does. Even by heavyweight standards, Pavlovich is a big puncher. Um, it is the fact that if he gets you in an exchange, he um, takes advantage of every single angle that does not require footwork to exploit. Right? You have lateral mm-hmm. angles. Yes, that is a very good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> you have lateral angles, the kinds which uh, Cyril Gaon and Tom Aspinall can find because they move their feet and they, they backstep and sidestep and occasionally even pivot. Um, uh, and those are, those are angles which can be used. But there's also a whole host of angles that take place when you're standing right in front of your opponent. You can change levels, right? And suddenly there's a new angle and your punches can come from right up the middle. They can come upwards from underneath. They can come around both sides. They can come in from over the top. Um, this is really like this is the idea that good combinations are made of. Is that uh, in part it is you will use setup punches to adjust your feet and get different angles. But once you're engaged in like a phone booth exchange, then it is exploiting different angles. Using an uppercut to set up a left hook is the classic. Using a body jab to set up an overhand right is a classic. Using a one-two to set up a three is a classic. Um, f- one punch feeding into the next, knowing that um, the opponent is going to have to react to getting hit by the first one or even avoiding the first one, and that that can be exploited by tur- by coming in from a different angle with the other hand. This is a really convoluted way of explaining that combination. Good combinations are comprised of punches which attack from every side. Um, and this is something Pavlovich is genuinely, I think, innately good at. He is looks like a super goofy chimpanzee style combination puncher. But, yes. but but the combinations are like tricky to deal with. They're really overwhelming. Yeah. And um You know, yeah, this is like, you know, guys like Cub Swanson have made mm-hmm. uh you know, at least parts of their careers of doing this, you know, is that you throw punches up the middle and then you throw huge looping shots around the side. Yeah. Uh and then people just, you know, they can't figure out what the trajectories are. Um yeah, Pavlovich will throw, he will jab, he will throw short shots, and yeah, he will throw mad, loopy shit. Yeah, insanely goofy, loopy shots. And I, I won't even say that he is completely, I think he may be like less heedless, or I, I don't know, it, different different styles of, uh, I, I wouldn't say he's completely um, unaware of shots coming back at him. Uh, it's just that like, 
He never plays pure defense ever when he's in an exchange. Mm-hmm. Tom Aspinall will, and then the defense is gone when he goes back into punching mode. Yep. Pavlovich will keep punching the whole time, but he will be looking at what's coming back at him. And like, there's a moment in his fight with Tai Tuivasa where he is piling on and he gets nailed a big overhand right as he's just trying to put the lights out and he resets and he comes back in and Tuivasa throws another right hand. And this one, he sort of glances off by throwing a same time, like left hook. But he is aware of the right hand that's coming at him. There's a reason he throws that shot. It's just that he's thinking, I'm going to crush you with this punch because I know what punch you're going to hit me with. Uh, and so he sort of manages to like glance it off the shoulder and then pile on yet another devastating combination. Um, but here's the thing, like Tom Aspinall is going to wrestle him, right? You would think so. He's definitely going to wrestle him. I have no doubt in my mind. That's all he wanted to do to Alexander Volkov, and with good reason. He's like, this guy's mm-hmm. huge. Um, I have a fantastically quick shot for a heavyweight. I can, I can grapple, and I can, I, I can actually like threaten submissions from a variety of positions. A lot of them are, I mean, you want to talk about Alexei Alinek. Tom Aspinall's last submission was a straight arm lock from like a figure four position. That's Mm -hmm. that shit only happens at heavyweight. But um, that is the kind of smart fighter he is. He's not going to go in there and think I'm going to like I have something to prove with Sergei Pavlovich on the feet. He's going to take him down. And so the question is, like, uh, how good is Sergei Pavlovich's takedown defense actually? And this is the worst question we ever have to answer when it comes to heavyweight fighters. Because the trouble is you look at, you could basically look at all their previous fights and be like, oh yeah, this is why heavyweights suck at wrestling. None of these guys have actually like done much to test his wrestling defense. It's very rare. Yeah, apart from obviously Overy who absolutely splattered them. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, I think Pavlovich has really good first-level takedown defense. Again, I think that's another thing that speaks to his athleticism. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he, in, in general, you know, having watched a bunch of his fights now, he does have a good sense of timing, a good sense of space. Like, his fight with Abdurakimov is about as, you know, technical as you're going to get from mm-hmm. him. He, he throws a bunch of jabs and then eventually, like, just KOs Abdurakimov with, like, a weird, obviously, mm-hmm. double hook. It was that like um, long right uppercut he likes to throw, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that is the basis of what you need to be, as well as an okay athlete, to have a yes, as you say, good first layer takedown defense. Because again, the other question about Tom Aspinall is, what does he have beyond? His first layer takedown offense. Does he have something beyond the shot? Because that's pretty much worked on everyone he's tried it on. Yeah, I want to say, um, I'll pull it up now to double check. I want to say he showed some layering against Volkov. Um, because obviously it's a vulnerability of Volkov's, but he's not super easy to just take down outright. Uh, not as much as he used to be. Not. Um, but yeah, I mean, pa- Pavlovich has a good sprawl and he, he is quick on the trigger just as he is in the pocket. Um, and certainly in his fight with Curtis Blades, Curtis didn't, you know, that's a lesson Aspinall will take. If he watches any footage at all, Curtis did not test the takedown defense until he was already in trouble. So there's a big asterisk yep. on that. But when Curtis was in trouble, he did get a decently timed shot. And Pavlovich just killed it dead uh, with a with a really strong sprawl. So if that is all Aspinall uh, has to bring, then I think it's basically a 50-50 fight. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Let's see. The fight ending takedown in, in Aspinall, Volkov was just a clean, like, counter shot. 
the one before that. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So I don't know. His timing is great. You know, he will choose the right moment. Yep. But uh, if he doesn't surprise Pavlovich with, uh, with a clean shot, then maybe he's stuck striking with him. And then how the fuck do you call that fight? Yeah. I think I'm still, I still, again, I kind of have to pick Aspinall again because of the depth of skill thing. Yeah. And I know that's not necessarily how heavyweight works. And again, I can also see my see him just getting into exchanges where um, I can just see him getting into exchanges and then getting lost in them and then just getting decked. But I think apart from anything else, it's it's just that he's going to be so much faster than Pavlovich. Like, even if he gets into trouble. He's going to be able to get back out of it much quicker yeah. than, uh, like Taitui Vasa and Curtis Blades and Certainly. people like that. Yeah, I think you know the Curtis Blades, the Curtis Blades thing can be looked at, uh, from the perspective of like, oh, he's just being overconfident and so on. But it all can also be looked at from the perspective of like, you need to put wrestlers on the back foot, otherwise they are going to, uh, you know back you into the fence and take put takedowns on mm-hmm. he might have just been saying you know i need to put push this guy backwards at all costs which again likely, would yeah. not necessarily be a bad or stupid gamble to take yeah I, that seems likely enough to me pavlovich just went in thinking yeah i'm gonna get hit i'm gonna walk into some shots but oh no sorry i, I meant um aspinall oh aspinall like, well i yeah. mean it's exactly the approach that, was... that pavlovich took too where he was also just like aspinall pavlovich's fight with blades he was like all over him and really just getting hit with a bunch mm-hmm. of straight shots. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, fair, fair point. I think for both guys <laughs> that perhaps you could call that a smart approach. I don't know that Pavlovich has other smart approaches is perhaps the point you're making. <laughs> no, no. But yes. My main thing is that like, uh, yes, this is a concerning fight from Tom Aspinall in many ways, but you could argue that like that was the right approach to take against Curtis Blades. Yeah. In broad strategic um, terms, it made sense. Yes, uh, but yes. Other than that, yeah, it's, it's just it's just the speed edge. Like, yeah, because that's the thing against like Volkov. It's not the uh, the technique behind the wrestling or anything like that. You know, other people have been able to take Volkov down, as you said. Mm-hmm. He's not a particularly good wrestler, but it's just the fact that he looks like he he's looks like he's like two thirds as slow as Aspinall yeah. uh, as Aspinall and. Everyone Sergei Pavlovich has fought has been notably pretty slow heavyweights, and yep. he hasn't looked like he's much faster than any of them. Yep. I think that just the speed difference is going to be really noticeable. I think, again, as I said, the main problem is that, like, as one of the main problems for Aspinall is that he's going to be absolutely lighting Pavlovich up. And that would be very exciting for him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I still think I'm going to pick him. I'm not really sure how. I guess he's... I don't know, they're big boys. I'll pick him for round one KO as well. We're not... Do more. I, yeah. Just pick all the big guys by just round one finish. Yeah, I mean, ground and pound or submission seems like a logical way to go to me. Um, mm-hmm. Again, he, he may... Pavlovich, like I said, he has good first layer takedown defense, but it's not been heavily tested. And... That is another area where speed is absolutely a huge advantage for Tom Aspinall. The speed and the timing of his shots is really good. The first one against Volkov, by the way, was a was actually a, a like sort of an outside trip from a body lock, which he uh, timed. He oh, stepped yeah. he stepped in on Volkov, timed a shot, just like a reactive shot, but like a you know Dan Henderson style, like Greco reactive shot. Got in on a body lock and then just dumped him over his knee. Um. So there's more than just a shot takedown in Aspinall's arsenal. And the timing is phenomenal. And, um, you know, I wouldn't expect it to work that easily because Pavlovich is big and strong. He is literally built like a refrigerator. But, uh, you know, you want to talk about concerning past fights. It is hard to overlook that bout with Alistair Overeem. Mm-hmm. Who did not do a 
really a particularly good job of like safely getting to wrestling positions. But once he got to them, um, you know, Pavlovich is just like there, there's the shell of a wrestling game and then you penetrate it and it's just hollow. And he just did not enjoy <laughs> having to be put on his back by Overeem. So again, yeah, just like the last fight, you got to pick the, the guy that you had the gut feeling for from the outset. But it is a heavyweight fight. And Pavlovich, I think, is not to be taken lightly. He is a good, instinctive... He is a very heavyweight heavyweight. He really is. A good, instinctive pocket puncher. Athletic, if it doesn't come through in foot speed, it does still come through in hand speed and accuracy. Um, And uh, if Tom Aspinall cannot get him down cleanly, again, I think it is at best a 50-50 fight where... As you said, Aspinall could have all the success in the world and it could undo him because I don't know that you want to be getting into repeated exchanges with Pavlovich if you can avoid it. Yep. All right. Uh, well, one more big beef boy fight to discuss. Brief thoughts after this break on Jailton Almeida versus Derek Lewis. And then in addition to that, we're going to just basically get into the chaff. Uh, a couple of undercard fights here that we're going to give a uh, cursory glance at, and uh, then we'll be done. After this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Well, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Let's talk about the, uh, the heavyweights from last weekend for just a moment. Jalton Almeida, Derek Lewis, um, really actually a very predictable fight in uh, a number of ways. Like, I think we saw, we certainly saw one of the versions of this fight that we said Derek Lewis could win. Yeah, like uh, suddenly it was that fight, right? Sometime in the second, was it the second round? I think the third, maybe. There were a yeah. couple moments, uh, the one where he got some serious, it might have been the second, there was like a one minute, th- 30 second period where um, Almeida went for his back, and I gotta say, even when you're like a really good agile grappler, when you're a heavyweight and you make a mistake, the consequences are unavoidably funny. Uh-huh. Because then they showed a slow motion replay of Almeida falling off the back. And it's like, this is, yep. this is like the height of grappling agility and flexibility in this division. But when he makes a positional mistake, he just looks like a big clumsy oaf. Cause that's what, yep. <laughs> that's how it works when you weigh 250 pounds or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, there was a moment where Derek Lewis benefited from, unlike every other heavyweight Almeida has fought, being extremely calm not freaking out and not burning energy on the ground still was fresh enough deeper into the fight to get like an opportunistic reversal, just giving up his back, letting Almeida get a little too excited to take it, letting him fall off the top. And for a brief window was starting to crush Almeida with strikes. That is one of the places Derek Lewis finishes people. Um, it's a credit to Almeida that he did not get finished there and, in fact, quickly started creating scrambles and I believe went for a deep half sweep, which turned into a single leg. And having this layer and this connectivity between his uh, jiu-jitsu and his wrestling really, really saved him. But, um, yeah, otherwise, it was uh, sort of what we expected, that Derek Lewis is not a good defensive wrestler. And he could be as calm and passive as he likes. The fact is that in top position, Jarleton Almeida is also very calm. And you can't just, like, weather the storm against him the way that Derek Lewis has against other heavyweights who are so desperate to take him down. 
Almeida not only dealt with the few explosions from Derek Lewis quite well across the board, because that's what he does. He's got a really good grappling game for this division. He waits for you to make some big expensive investment in trying to escape and just floats, just lets the scramble happen, um, lets you sort of just lumber around like a tortoise overturned, and then lo and behold, he's still on top of you. Uh, a great counter even to the Derek Lewis approach, one which resulted in, I gotta say, a really shitty fight. Yep. <laughs> it, it sucked to watch. <laughs> it really, it was, bad. it was, it was basically, honestly, to, to give Almeida credit, it was like, um, Corey Sandhagen's last fight. Who was that? That's exactly what I was thinking of. Occasionally these things happen. Rob you just Font. Get. Yep. Occasionally, the, you know, the benefit of this is that now, at least nowadays, if something like this happens, people just shrug it off and say that was a shit fight. Mm -hmm. Because back in the day when this kind of stuff happened, people would be like, this is killing the sport. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is fortunately no chance of that happening nowadays yeah there's too but many yeah, cards none um, of them matter nobody can remember anything a week later so yeah i'm not sure what to think of this one for Jelton almeida it's a real like i think it's it, it really fits along the uh the same lines as like Chimaev's last performance, if you consider the uh, similar expectations for each man, i.e. one of them is expected to do well in a actually good division, and one of them is expected to do well in a terrible division. A terrible division, yeah. Um, because, you know, on the one hand, he went five rounds, won every single round against uh, someone who was... Well, to be honest, famously been able to pull off like late comebacks against many mm -hmm. people. Um, he's quite undersized for a heavyweight. He was up against a huge heavyweight he was grappling with, again, who is famous for gassing people out when they grapple with him. All this is good. On the other hand, mm -hmm. Sergei Spivak submitted Derek Lewis almost immediately. <laughs> Unless Derek Lewis has just gotten really much better at submission grappling since then. Uh, you know, we have to then say, how much better at submission grappling is is Almeida than Sergei Spivak? Considerably is the is the correct answer. Um, yeah, but in an MMA context, he like Spivak got Lewis out of there immediately. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Also, I think Luke Thomas was saying this. I think briefly, I saw this popping up on Twitter. He was like, "That well, was that was Almeida's ground and pound." Mm hmm. Why was this such a positional... I mean, admittedly, this is, I think, at least partially due to the size differential. Mm -hmm. That and the, you know, the thing which makes so many people fail against Derek Lewis is that they try and split their time between controlling him and putting him back down and punching him and that he just explodes out at some point and then they panic. Yeah. I think Almeida largely just end the idea of striking... Mm-hmm. Because uh, he was doing it a bit more earlier on in the fight, but then just completely gave up. Uh, partially because he probably also was getting really annoyed that he couldn't tap him. Um, yeah, I, I think... But yeah, it's definitely... I think it's a, it's a hold from me. Because I expected Almeida to submit him instantaneously. Um, I, I'm, very inclined, quickly. I'm inclined to be a little more complimentary of Almeida for this performance, because he undeniably dominated Derek Lewis for the entirety of the fight. He did it with the exception of that one moment where he got a little clumsy uh, and slipped off Lewis's back. He did it with like zero room, zero room for Derek Lewis to do anything effective. And I think this is why he is a really good heavyweight grappler. Like you, he he's, he was just perfectly content to slow cook Derek Lewis, getting just enough shots off to keep the position. And there were a couple of moments where he fired in some bursts. There was the, as you said, early on, it kind of went away. But then in, I think, after the reversal from Lewis, he then started cracking him again with shots. One thing that Michael Bispin kept pointing out, though, on commentary, which I think is very valid, is uh, 
or maybe it was Cruz actually. He wasn't firing like any elbows, which is kind of weird. Mm. He had Derek Lewis mounted, like fighting to control his wrists, and it didn't seem to occur to him that like that this is a classic setup for a clean ground strike. You're you're in completely dominant position. The guy's holding your wrist. He's not controlling your whole arm. You can just crush him with an elbow. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the way in which this is, this is damning, I don't think really says anything bad about Jalatin Almeida as like a competitor. That like, clearly he's, he's phenomenal. He's as good as we thought he was. Um, he went in there. Derek Lewis had no breathing room. He just got crushed on the ground the entire fight. You can critique him for like not doing enough with it. That's the only criticism that you can possibly level at Almeida here. Um, it's like the Corey Sandhagen Rob Font fight, like a terrible, terrible fight to watch, but in its own way, a really impressive smothering performance. I, I can't really find it in myself to like knock Almeida for um, not making a potentially really costly decision or expending a lot of energy. Like that is a way in which he could have actually lost this fight. If he had gone for it too hard, uh, cause I think we can agree is striking ain't much. Uh, and if he had ever ended up in a position in this fight where he could not at will take Derek Lewis down again, he would have probably been in trouble. Uh, he would have definitely been in trouble. Yeah. So, I mean, but that, that's for me. That's why, that's why it's a hold. I think. That's yeah. Why, yeah. Fair enough. Cause I'm like, I have some good things. Also, like, Clearly, he hasn't gotten any better at striking. No. Nope. Uh, is perhaps less potent from top position than we thought, which means, like, can, he can effectively win rounds, which is good, without mm-hmm. having to tap people. But also, you know, you have to be incredibly dynamic on the ground if that's literally your only way to win. I, I think it's just that his if finishes are if very... If he's just going to front... Mm-hmm. Go on. If, if his striking is just going to be front kick into double leg, <laughs> like he has to be the most potent grappler in the world in order for that to work. If he doesn't round out his game, then you know this is quickly going to run into problems somewhere. Phil says, without really thinking about what division they're in, maybe he won't. <laughs> maybe he'll just destroy everyone <laughs> with front kick into double leg. Maybe ask. Maybe Tom Aspel will, will be like, no one's ever actually tried to take me down. Hey, I think we can agree. Curtis Blades would beat him. Oh yeah, for sure. That's, just, I mean, that's why this was that was a a much more interesting performance. Just somebody I mean, sorry, he, performance, uh, like matchup. Yeah, somebody he can't take down is obviously like a death sentence for Almeida. That is the concerning thing: is that we what we saw here is a fight in which he completely and confidently won, but showed nothing new, and it it also cemented the idea. Uh, really like permanently until I see some evidence against it, that Almeida's ability to finish people on the ground is, this is why it's so good for heavyweight, but why it was so frustrating here. It's totally reliant on the opponent making a catastrophic error. He didn't show a great ability to force huge errors out of Derek Lewis. And again, it's hard for me to critique him for that because this is a fight where he was basically constantly in mount. (laughs) Like how much more of an error can you force? And that's why you can critique him. He should have been killing him because he was constantly in like one of the best positions you can possibly find yourself in in a fight. But because of the Zen of Derek Lewis, um, huge openings just weren't being given to him. The opponent was not panicking. Uh, he was only giving his back knowing what he was dealing with and it, at like considered moments and wasn't burning a ton of energy. That's the Derek Lewis game on the ground. Yeah, I don't know. I suppose the more I talk about it, the more I'm coming around to it being okay to shit on Almeida for this, but... Um... Yeah, I mean, like, again, he showed showed some things uh, which were good. It also showed some concerning things, but, like, the main problems, which is that this man needs to be able to take down everyone. Yeah. Uh, and also hope that no one knows how to counter a front kick. <laughs> and, um... and it certainly does mean that yeah, in, in matchups where e- even if he can get taken out but can't get them consistently, that um, 
Again, he has added nothing else. So it mm-hmm. doesn't even necessarily have to be Curtis Blades. It could be Sergei Pavlovich. Like Honestly, it could be like Marcin Tibera. It could be. Just a grimy dude who I would, just I would or just like I, I honestly I think he should fight Sergei Spivak next. Sure. Because they both beat Derek Lewis. I don't think he should be going there a title. Not even because he wouldn't win one, because he actually probably still could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got the right matchup. For sure. He somehow like Got Cyril Garn for an interim bout, and he was just like front kick to take down, and Cyril Garn was like, "Ah, <laughs> somebody he, I want to see no. him against somebody a measured test, somebody he can get down, but maybe can't continue to get down for the whole fight." Um, yeah. and I would like to see Spivak. Yeah, I think that makes sense. That or Tabora, uh, or if you really want to put him through the ringer, you give him Curtis Blade, somebody that he literally can't take down. And again, I think that one at this point is a certain loss. I think I yeah. think Curtis Blades would straight up outbox him. Yep, I very confidently picked Blades. I would have done so before they fought, and more so now. Yep. All right, so uh, what else? There's a couple other things coming up here on the UFC 295 undercard. We could talk about them very briefly. Uh, Mackenzie Dern is back. She's taking on Jessica Andrade. Does not feel kind to Jessica Andrade, but uh, I don't know how you can be kind to her. You know, I feel sympathy for Jessica. Like, uh, I just think it, I get the feeling that her whole career, like she's, she's obviously been such a huge talent her entire career and Mm -hmm. has basically just like not been taken care of as a fighter. Like there was that weird and disconcerting thing that came out that like she was like pressured by her manager into doing like her only fans or something. Yeah, that was. She brilliant. really, really did not want to be doing that. Um, and I think this is just an, an unfortunately predictable, sad ending to her MMA career that we're seeing right now. That this is a fighter with all the potential in the world, and it has just never been realized. Uh, it has never been built upon in any meaningful, durable kind of way. That we've seen her add little wrinkles for fights here and there. But essentially, she spent her entire career being strong and powerful and tough and relying so heavily on these things that now that the uh, the wheels are starting to come off, she's just looking bad in every single fight. Um, Yeah, there isn't really much else you can say. Uh, She really seems like... Uh, yeah, she's coming to the end at this point. Admittedly, everyone she's fought has been very good lately, but she is still riding a three-fight losing streak. She's getting finished a lot more. You know, her fundamental problems of being bad in the clinch and bad defensively have never gone away, but now they're... Yeah, she can't just toss her way out of subs or uh, through the clinch, and she can't just shrug off any strike that hits her. Yeah. Which... Yeah, it's just it just says bad things, and I mean, Mackenzie Dern is, I think, a better matchup for her than many because sure. Mackenzie Dern still isn't that good, but Dern is still going to be bigger than her, and um, even if Dern isn't a great wrestler, I think all she's probably going to need is really one takedown. And it's just it, all it happens. And Andrade is not exactly the best at uh, keeping out of the clinch. No, not so at like all. if they hit the ground by accident, Dern will probably tap her. And I think she'd put herself in a bad position if she tried to fight in a style which was meant to avoid the clinch. I certainly would not want to be Jessica Andrade just giving up pressure to Mackenzie Dern and like mm-hmm. trying to be slick she doesn't have the skill set for it and dern is uh i don't know perhaps she's uh overcome the rage which clearly fueled her last performance but she is still uh a complete mess but in her own way a kind of a terror if you just allow her to come forward um yeah i think this is one of those ones where like there's a decent chance that Mackenzie dern actually beats Andrade on the feet, not particularly because she's like an amazing striker, just because she can throw, she's bigger and she can throw lots of strikes really hard. Yeah. 
I mean, she's, let's be clear, she is the opposite of a particularly good striker. <laughs> she's actually a notably uh-huh. bad striker. And, uh, yeah, there were little small improvements in her last fight, mostly around just the idea that she kept the combinations going. She was putting herself in bad positions. But I think she can, me- I think she is mechanically throwing punches better than she used to. I, I think so. It used to be she would throw the ugliest punch you've ever seen and missing would cause her to spin around three times. Uh, like a fucking mm-hmm. Looney Tunes character. Um, so yeah, she looked a lot more. I think what we said at the time is she just looked confident and comfortable. She didn't shy away. She didn't pull any of her shots. And if she missed, it was just a springboard from that position into throwing more punches. Um, yeah, this is just kind of a vibe pick for me more than anything. It's like, yeah, Dern is still confident. She's still aggressive and. I just don't think Jessica Andrade is um, enjoying being a fighter at the moment. It doesn't seem to have been enjoying it for some time now. So, uh, all right. I, I think that'll Over probably here, that'll probably be enough for this episode. We, we spent plenty of time, deservedly, I think, on the main event. And uh, we'll be back next week to talk about what the hell happened with all these big, beefy lads. Uh, of course, the week after, there is a Fight Night card, the main event of which is Brandon Allen versus Paul Craig. I guess. I mean, they're, they're, still, they're still pretty beefy. Still definitely on the beefiest side of things. Yeah, let me just do a quick run down here. We've got some bantamweight fights, Phil. Are you excited? Are they Good. Bantamweight fight. You're going to know all... Let off. me tell you, you're going to know who all these guys are. You're going to get excited when I tell you. Bantamweight showdown. Peyton Talbot. Versus, oh, my God. <laughs> versus Nick Aguirre. But that's not all. Really? That's not all. Jose Johnson versus Chad and Helliger is also on the card. I mean, I mean slick Nick Aguirre. <laughs> I'm already... <laughs> I'm already pumped for this card. Is that actually his nickname? uh, And those other people that you mentioned, I think it is, yes. (laughs) You actually know more about these fighters than I would have suspected. (laughs) Yeah, Peyton Talbot. I literally just looked it up. I only had time to look up one. (laughs) I've been looking for Peyton Talbot's UFC debut for some time now, I gotta say. Um, I'm just going to find out if he has a stupid nickname, too. Peyton, nope. <laughs> He's just Peyton Nope Talbot. That's actually not bad. He's <laughs> just Peyton Talbot. All right. Well. Uh, anyway, I suppose I'm still looking forward to seeing Sergey the Cephalopod Pavlovich uh, this weekend. A nickname he should definitely adopt. And uh, we'll yeah. be back next week to talk about a bunch of shit. I guess. Until then. Find us on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson at Boxing Bush. Find me on Blue Sky if you want. I'm hardly posting on either of them, but hey, it's at King Typo dot B Sky dot Social or however the hell they configure their stupid screen names on that stupid website. We'll be back next week to talk to you about all that crap. And until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. All right. I was also thinking, we, uh, like, people aren't going to know why he's Sergei the Pavlovich, because we never actually explained it in the episode. I'm going to put that, that's going to be our cold open. Cold open. Oh, okay, cool. the, the, I'm, I already decided, the first part of the show will be you explaining how he's has octopus tentacles for punches. <laughs> Sweet. All right. All right, man. Thank you, as always. Tom is much appreciated. You too. All right. Have a good one. You too. I will talk to you next week. I will talk to you next week. Okay. See you. All right. Bye.